I think the melody in general is the strongest part of music. And it's the, uh, it's, I mean, you know, rhythm. Rhythm is a very basic part in, in, uh, uh, in the production of music. And it's so, it's not timeless. It has very much to do with the period on uh, which the music is written. If you listen to the, the 19th century, it's all three quarters, it's all waltz. Because the waltz rhythm was uh, the rhythm of that century, and now we have four to the bar. And, uh, but the production and the rhythm and the themes, of course, of the lyrics, they are always uh, very much part of the century and the, uh, the time you are living in, whereas the melody is able to go through the generations. Like you still can whistle, I'm sure, the, the main theme of the magic flute or, or any, any strong composition, Beethoven, and, and, but what is it you, you remember? You remember the melody. And so to me, another thing which made Krafix really successful is the strong melody. Kraftwerk never did any connections with anybody else. They were just on their own. Ralph and Florian were very much aware that they didn't want any connection. They just want to sustain their independence in every perspective, business-wise and uh, as artists. And that made possible this unique and strong um, output, I guess. And these strong statements, there were nothing interfering with this, uh, with this solitary mind. When we played in, in England, and uh, um, was it the Melody Maker? No, I think New Music Express at the centerfold. Uh, and we were sitting on the table, this Trans Europe Express table, and they're putting the Nuremberg Reichsparteitag with the swastika. And this was really mean and awful. Uh, we, we, we didn't know anything to do with it. I mean, uh, we certainly had no resolution, final solution for the musical problems. And so it was just the opposite. We, we felt like we were touching new ground and we were quite happy with this tiny little inventions of uh, little pop music uh, stuff. It had a little bit to do with uh, the success and it was a drawback of independence, completely independence, no deadline, and totally artistic freedom. You know, creativity sometimes starts with the deadline and with a lack of money and with um, only a few possibilities, with not too many options. If you have too many options, and this applies to today's music production scene. There are too many options in, in the computers. You have one program and you have the world. With access to the internet, you have all musical productions ever done on a tiny little iPhone or what is called iTunes. And um, there's too many options. And in, with the early Kraftwerk, Productions, there were not so many options, and that made creativity floating much more easy. And I think that was a time when confusion really started. Uh, the next album after the. No, we had this construction, uh, constructivismus of um, Man Machine, then we had the computer world, and then we had. The next record should have 
been called Technopop, which was a right cool consequence coming from Japan, from the, from the uh, World Tour 81, having all these things in mind. So actually we found a name at that time for our music. It was supposed to call, uh, we were supposed to call it Technopop and that was the name of the record. But somehow uh, we got confused over the production. I remember spending years on the production of Technopop between 81 and uh, 84. Yes, 84. And Tour de France was supposed to be one track of Technopop. And we had apparently the track Technopop as one track of the record and sex object and the telephone call. And Ralph went to New York to electric power plant, to the power plant studio and made a completely uh, mix of the record. So a completely finished production. And somehow in his mind and probably in Florian's mind, they got confused with the result. It sounded great, of course, but they didn't like it somehow. And then they decided to skip it and to start all over again. And from that point on, things got very hard and not easy like on the productions before, somehow. So we ended up after several tries to change the compositions which at that time was a rather a hard process because they were all recorded on tape, on multi-track. And uh, you didn't erase tape that easy <laughs> at that time. So instead of starting from scratch again or wiping out completely a whole tape, we tried to make it better and better by adding stuff and erasing one, maybe one track and keeping the rest and try to, and we try to long from my point of view now to improve it. Okay, the bottom line was uh, we went for, I went with Ralph, no, we flew over to New York, recorded, recorded and remixed and re-remixed and re-re-remixed the record there. And I, Florian went home after one month. I went home after two months. And Ralph went home after three months with the finished record. And that record was then called um, Electric Cafe. There's a story because it was the name of the, of a, TV show in France at that time, and I, I forgot the details. I, you can blame me for that, but uh, it got lost in the dust of the Museum of Music. So that was a, this is a story actually about the first part of the 80s, uh, which we missed really. I, I guess Kraftwerk missed the 80s completely. And somehow uh, we spent our time in the ivory tower of uh, Kling Klang Studio. And after, uh, and after the flop of Electric Cafe, it was completely a flop at that time. Again, uh, there was one guy who mentioned the idea of making a best of record, craft of best of, to capitalize on that, which was basically a good idea. And well, this turned out to be the remix album, but unfortunately we did the remixes by ourselves, which is a good idea, but it made, it made the record and the output of the record slow again. It was finished in uh, 90, 91, I guess, and I left the band in 1990, August 1990. So the 80s were not so su successful, 
in retrospect.